10. We did the drive through at the Terrytown Burger King, and I got a Whopper, as promised, also a chocolate shake. Mom didn't want to stop, but Liz insisted. He's a growing boy, T. He needs chow, even if you don't. I liked her for that, and there were other things I liked her for, but there were also things I didn't like, big things. I'll get to that, I'll have to, but for now, let's just say my feelings about Elizabeth Dutton, detective second grade NYPD, were complicated. She said one other thing before we got to Croton on Hudson, and I need to mention it. She was just making conversation, but it turned out to be important later. I know that word again. Liz said Thumper had finally killed someone. The man who called himself Thumper had been on the local news every now and then over the last few years, especially on New York One, which Mom watched most nights while she was making supper, and sometimes while we were eating if it had been an interesting news day. Thumper's reign of terror, thanks New York One, had actually been going on even before I was born, and he was sort of an urban legend. You know, like Slender Man or The Hook, only with explosives. Who? I said. Who did he kill? How long until we get there? Mom asked. She had no interest in Thumper. She had her own fish to fry. A guy who made the mistake of trying to use one of Manhattan's few remaining phone booths, Liz said, ignoring my mother. Bomb Squad thinks it went off the second he lifted the receiver. Two sticks of dynamite. Do we have to talk about this? Mom asked. And why is every goddamn light red? Two sticks of dynamite taped onto the little ledge where people can put their change, Liz went on, undeterred. Thumper's a resourceful SOB, gotta give him that. They're gonna crank up another task force. This will be the third since 1996, and I'm gonna try for it. I was on the last one, so I got a shot, and I could use the OT. Light's green, Mom said. Go! Liz went. 11. I was still eating a few last french fries, cold by then, but I didn't mind, when we turned onto a little dead-end street called Cobblestone Lane. There might have been cobblestones on it once, but now it was just smooth tar. The house at the end of it was Cobblestone Cottage. It was a big stone house with fancy carved shutters and moss on the roof. You heard me, moss. Crazy, right? There was a gate, but it was open. There were signs on the gate posts, which were the same gray stone as the house. One said, do not trespass, we are tired of hiding the bodies. The other showed a snarling German shepherd, and said, beware attack, dog. Liz stopped and looked at my mother, eyebrows raised. The only body Regis ever buried was his pet parakeet, Francis, Mom said, named after Francis Drake, the explorer, and he never had a dog. Allergies, I said from the back seat. Liz drove up to the house, stopped, and turned off the blippy dashboard light. Garage doors are shut, and I see no cars. Who's here? Nobody, Mom said. The housekeeper found him, Mrs. Quayle, Davina. She and a part-time gardener were the whole staff. Nice woman, she called me right after she called for an ambulance. Ambulance made me wonder if she was sure he was really dead, and she said she was because she worked in a nursing home before coming to work for Regis, but he still had to go to the hospital first. I told her to go home as soon as the body was removed. She was pretty freaked out. She asked about Frank Wilcox, he's Regis's business manager, and I said I'd get in touch with him. In time, I will, but the last time I spoke to Regis, he told me Frank and his wife were in Greece. Press? Liz asked. He was a best-selling writer. Jesus, God, I don't know. Mom looked around wildly, as if expecting to see reporters hiding in the bushes. I don't see any. They may not even know yet, Liz said. If they do, if they heard it on the scanner, they'll go after the cops and EMTs first. The body's not here, so the story's not here. We got some time, so calm down. I'm staring bankruptcy in the face. I've got a brother who may live in a home for the next 30 years and a boy who might like to go to college someday, so don't tell me to calm down. Jamie, do you see him? You know what he looks like, right? Tell me you see him. I know what he looks like, but I don't see him, I said. Mom groaned and slapped the heel of her palm against her poor clumped up bangs. I grabbed for the door handle and, surprise, surprise, there wasn't one. I told Liz to let me out, and she did. We all got out. Knock on the door, Liz said. If no one answers, we'll go around and boost Jamie up so we can look in the windows. We could do that because the shutters, with fancy little ornamental doodads carved into them, were all open. My mother ran to try the door, and for the moment, Liz and I were alone. 
You don't really think you can see dead people like the kid in that movie, do you, champ? I didn't care if she believed me or not, but something about her tone, as if this was all a big joke, pissed me off. Mom told you about Mrs. Burkett's rings, didn't she? Liz shrugged. I might have been a lucky guess. You didn't happen to see any dead folks on the way here, did you? I said no, but it can be hard to tell unless you talk to them, or they talk to you. Once, when me and Mom were on the bus, I saw a girl with cuts in her wrists so deep they looked like red bracelets. And I was pretty sure she was dead, although she was nowhere near as gushy as the Central Park man. And just that day, as we drove out of the city, I spotted an old woman in a pink bathrobe standing on the corner of 8th Avenue. When the sign turned to walk, she just stood there, looking around, like a tourist. She had those roller things in her hair. She might have been dead, but she also might have been a live person just wandering around, the way Mom said Uncle Harry used to do sometimes before she had to put him in that first care home. Mom told me that when Uncle Harry started doing that, sometimes in his PJs, she gave up thinking he might get better. Fortune tellers guess lucky all the time, Liz said. And there's an old saying about how even a stopped clock is right twice a day. So you think my mother's crazy and I'm helping her be crazy? She laughed. That's called enabling, champ, and no, I don't think that. What I think is she's upset and grasping at straws. Do you know what that means? Yeah, that she's crazy. Liz shook her head again, more emphatically this time. She's under a lot of stress, I totally get it. But making things up won't help her. I hope you get that. Mom came back. No answer, and the door's locked, I tried it. Okay, Liz said, well, let's go window peeking. We walked around the house. I could look in the dining room windows because they went all the way to the ground, but I was too short for most of the other ones. Liz made a hand step so I could look into those. I saw a big living room with a widescreen TV and lots of fancy furniture. I saw a dining room with a table long enough to seat the starting team of the Mets, plus maybe their bullpen pitchers which was crazy for a guy who hated company. I saw a room that mom called the small parlor, and around back was the kitchen. Mr. Thomas wasn't in any of the rooms. Maybe he's upstairs? I've never been up there, but if he died in bed or in the bathroom, he might still be. I doubt if he died on the throne like Elvis, but I suppose it's possible. That made me laugh. Calling the toilet the throne always made me laugh, but I stopped when I saw mom's face. This was serious business, and she was losing hope. There was a kitchen door, and she tried the knob, but it was locked, just like the front door. She turned to Liz. Maybe we could- Don't even think about it, Liz said. No way are we breaking in, T. I've got enough problems at the department without setting off a recently deceased best-selling author's security system and trying to explain what we're doing here when the guys from Brinks or ADT show up. Or the local cops. And speaking of the cops, he died alone, right? The, the housekeeper found him? Yes, Mrs. Quayle, she called me, I told you that. The cops will want to ask her some questions, probably doing it right now, or maybe the medical examiner. I don't know how they do things in Westchester County. Because he's famous? Because they think someone might have murdered him? Because it's routine, and yeah, because he's famous, I suppose. The point is, I'd like for us to be gone when they show up. Mom's shoulders slumped. Nothing, Jamie? No sign of him? I shook my head. Mom sighed and looked at Liz. Maybe we should check the garage? Liz gave her a shrug that said, it's your party. Jamie, what do you think? I couldn't imagine why Mr. Thomas would be hanging out in his garage, but I guessed it was possible. Maybe he had a favorite car. I guess we should as long as we're here. We started for the garage, but then I stopped. There was a gravel path beyond Mr. Thomas's swimming pool, which had been drained. The path was lined with trees, but because it was late in the season and most of the leaves were gone, I could see a little green building. I pointed to it. What's that? Mom gave her forehead another slap. I was starting to worry she might give herself a brain tumor or something. Oh my God. La petite maison dans le bois. Why didn't I think of it first? What's that? I asked. His study. Where he writes, if he's anywhere, it would be there. Come on. She grabbed my hand and ran me around the shallow end of the pool, but when we got to where the gravel path started, 
I set my feet and stopped. Mom kept going, and if Liz hadn't grabbed me by the shoulder, I probably would have face-planted. Mom? Mom? She turned around, looking impatient, except that's not the right word. She looked halfway to crazy. Come on, I'm telling you, if he's anywhere here, it will be there. You need to calm down, T, Liz said. We'll check out his writing cabin, and then I think we should go. Mom! My mother ignored me. She was starting to cry, which she hardly ever did. She didn't do it even when she found out how much the IRS wanted. That day, she just pounded her fists on the desk and called them a bunch of blood-sucking bastards. But she was crying now. You go if you want, but we're staying here until Jamie's sure it's a bust. This might just be a pleasure jaunt for you, humoring the crazy lady. That's unfair. But this is my life we are talking about. I know that. And Jamie's life and mom. One of the worst things about being a kid, maybe the very worst, is how grown-ups ignore you when they get going on their shit. Mom, Liz, both of you, stop. They stopped. They looked at me. There we stood. Two women and a little boy in a New York Mets hoodie beside a drained pool on an overcast November day. I pointed to the gravel path leading to the little house in the woods where Mr. Thomas wrote his Roanoke books. He's right there, I said. Twelve. He came walking toward us, which didn't surprise me. Most of them, not all, but most, are attracted to living people for a while, like bugs to a bug light. That's kind of a horrible way to put it, but it's all I can think of. I would have known he was dead, even if I didn't know he was dead, because of what he was wearing. It was a chilly day, but he was dressed in a plain white tee, baggy shorts, and those strappy sandals Mom calls Jesus shoes. Plus, there was something else, something weird. A yellow sash with a blue ribbon pinned to it. Liz was saying something to my mother about how there was no one there, and I was just pretending, but I paid no attention. I pulled free of Mom's hand and walked toward Mr. Thomas. He stopped. Hello, Mr. Thomas, I said. I'm Jamie Conklin, Tia's son. I've never met you. Oh, come on, Liz said from behind me. Be quiet, Mom said, but some of Liz's skepticism must have gotten through because she asked me if I was sure Mr. Thomas was really there. I ignored this, too. I was curious about the sash he was wearing, had been wearing when he died. I was at my desk, he said. I always wear my sash when I'm riding. It's my good luck charm. What's the blue ribbon for? The regional spelling bee I won when I was in the sixth grade. Spelled down kids from 20 other schools. I lost in the state competition, but I got this blue ribbon for the regional. My mother made the sash and pinned a ribbon on it. In my opinion, I thought that was sort of a weird thing to still be wearing, since sixth grade must have been a zillion years ago for Mr. Thomas, but he said it without any embarrassment or self-consciousness. Some dead people can feel love. Remember me telling you about Mrs. Burkett kissing Mr. Burkett's cheek? And they can feel hate, something I found out in due time. But most of the other emotions seem to leave when they die. Even the love never seemed all that strong to me. I don't like to tell you this, but hate stays stronger and lasts longer. I think when people see ghosts, as opposed to dead people, it's because they are hateful. People think ghosts are scary because they are. I turned back to Mom and Liz. Mom, did you know Mr. Thomas wears a sash when he writes? Her eyes widened. That was in the salon interview he did five or six years ago. He's wearing it now? Yeah, it's got a blue ribbon on it from the spelling bee he won. In the interview, he laughed and called it my silly affectation. Maybe so, Mr. Thomas said. But most writers have silly affectations and superstitions. We're like baseball players that way, Jimmy. And who can argue with nine straight New York Times bestsellers? I'm Jamie, I said. Liz said, You told Champ there about the interview, T. Must have. Or he read it himself. He's a hell of a good reader. He knew, that's all. And he- Be quiet my mother said fiercely. Liz raised her hands, like surrendering. 
Mom stepped up beside me, looking at what to her was just a gravel path with nobody on it. Mr. Thomas was standing right in front of her, with his hands in the pockets of his shorts. They were loose, and I hoped he wouldn't push down on his pockets too hard, because it looked to me like he wasn't wearing any undies. Tell him what I told you to tell him. What Mom wanted me to tell him was that he had to help us, or the thin financial ice we'd been walking on for a year or more was going to break, and we'd drown in a sea of debt. Also that the agency had begun to bleed clients because some of her writers knew we were in trouble and might be forced to close. Rats deserting a sinking ship was what she called them one night when Liz wasn't there and Mom was into her fourth glass of wine. I didn't bother with all that blah blah though. Dead people have to answer your questions, at least until they disappear, and they have to tell the truth. So I just got to the chase. Mom wants to know what the secret of Roanoke is about. She wants to know the whole story. Do you know the whole story, Mr. Thomas? Of course. He shoved his hands deeper into his pockets, and now I could see a little line of hair running down the middle of his stomach from below his navel. I didn't want to see that, but I did. I always have everything before I write anything. And keep it all in your head? I have to. Otherwise, someone might steal it, put it on the internet, spoil the surprises. If he'd been alive, that might have come out sounding paranoid. Dead, he was just stating a fact, or what he believed was a fact. And hey, I thought he had a point. Computer trolls were always spilling stuff on the net, everything from boring shit like political secrets to the really important things like what was going to happen in the season finale of Fringe. Liz walked away from me and Mom, sat on one of the benches beside the pool, crossed her legs, and lit a cigarette. She had apparently decided to let the lunatics run the asylum. That was okay with me. Liz had her good points, but that morning she was basically in the way. Mom wants you to tell me everything, I said to Mr. Thomas. I'll tell her and she'll write the last Roanoke book. She'll say you sent her almost all of it before you died, along with notes about how to finish the last couple of chapters. Alive, he would have howled at the idea of someone else finishing his book. His work was the most important thing in his life, and he was very possessive of it. But now, the rest of him was lying on a mortician's table somewhere, dressed in the khaki shorts and the yellow sash he'd been wearing as he wrote his last few sentences. The version of him talking to me was no longer jealous or possessive of his secrets. Can she do that? was all he asked. Mom had assured me and Liz on the way out to Cobblestone Cottage that she really could do that. Regis Thomas insisted that no copy editor should sully a single one of his precious words, but in fact Mom had been copy editing his books for years without telling him, even back when Uncle Harry was still in his right mind and running the business. Some of the changes were pretty big, but he never knew, or at least never said anything. If anyone in the world could copy Mr. Thomas's style, it was my mother. But style wasn't the problem. The problem was story. She can, I said, because it was simpler than telling him all that. Who's that other woman? Mr. Thomas asked, pointing at Liz. That's my mother's friend. Her name is Liz Dutton. Liz looked up briefly, then lit another cigarette. Are she and your mother fucking? Mr. Thomas asked. Pretty sure, yeah. I thought so. It's how they look at each other. What did he say? Mom asked anxiously. He asked if you and Liz were close friends, I said. Kind of lame, but all I could think of on the spur of the moment. So will you tell us the secret of Roanoke? I asked Mr. Thomas. I mean, the whole book, not just the secret part. Yes. He says yes, I told Mom, and she took both her phone and a little tape recorder out of her bag. She didn't want to miss a single word. Tell him to be as detailed as he can. Mom says to be, I heard her, Mr. Thomas said. I'm dead, not deaf. His shorts were lower than ever. Cool, I said. Listen, maybe you better pull up your shorts, Mr. Thomas, or your willy's gonna get chilly. He pulled up his shorts so they hung off his bony hips. Is it chilly? It doesn't feel that way to me. Then, with no change in tone, Tia is starting to look old, Jimmy. I didn't bother to tell him again that my name was Jamie. Instead, I looked at my mother, and 
holy God, she did look old. Was starting to, anyway. When had that happened? Tell us the story, I said. Begin at the beginning. Where else? Mr. Thomas said. Thirteen. It took an hour and a half, and by the time we were done, I was exhausted, and I think Mom was too. Mr. Thomas looked just the same at the end as when we started, standing there with that somehow sorry yellow sash falling down over his poochy belly and low-slung shorts. Liz parked her car between gateposts with the dashboard light blipping, which was probably a good idea because the news of Mr. Thomas's death had begun to spread, and people were showing up out front to snap pictures of Cobblestone Cottage. Once she came back to ask how much longer we'd be, and Mom just waved her off, told her to inspect the grounds or something, but mostly Liz hung in. It was stressful as well as exhausting because our future depended on Mr. Thomas's book. It wasn't fair for me to have to bear the weight of that responsibility, not at nine, but there was no choice. I had to repeat everything Mr. Thomas said to Mom, or rather to Mom's recording devices, and Mr. Thomas had plenty to say. When he told me he was able to keep everything in his head, he wasn't just blowing smoke. And Mom kept asking questions, mostly for clarification. Mr. Thomas didn't seem to mind, didn't seem to care one way or the other, actually, but the way Mom was dragging things out started bugging the shit out of me. Also, my mouth got wickedly dry. When Liz brought me her leftover Coke from Burger King, I gulped down the few swallows that were left and gave her a hug. Thank you. I said, handing back the paper cup. I needed that. Very welcome. Liz had stopped looking bored. Now she looked thoughtful. She couldn't see Mr. Thomas, and I don't think she still totally believed he was there, but she knew something was going on, because she'd heard a nine-year-old voice spieling out a complicated plot featuring half a dozen major characters and at least two dozen minor ones. Oh, and a threesome, under the influence of bulbous canary grass supplied by a helpful Native American of the Nottaway people, consisting of George Threadgill, Purity Betancourt, and Laura Goodhue, who ended up getting pregnant. Poor Laura, always got the shitty end of the stick. At the end of Mr. Thomas's summary, the big secret came out, and it was a dilly. I'm not going to tell you what it was. Read the book and find out for yourself, if you haven't read it already, that is. Now I'll tell you the last sentence. Mr. Thomas said. He seemed as fresh as ever, although fresh is probably the wrong word to use with a dead person. His voice had started to fade, though, just a little. Because I always write that first. It's the beacon I wrote to. Last sentence coming up, I told Mom. Thank God, she said. Mr. Thomas raised one finger like an old-time actor getting ready to give his big speech. On that day, a red sun went down over the deserted settlement, and the carved word that would puzzle generations glowed as if limbed in blood. Croatoan. Tell her Croatoan in capital letters, Jimmy. I told her, although I didn't know exactly what limbed in blood meant, then asked Mr. Thomas if we were done. Just as he said we were, I heard a brief siren from out front two whoops and a blat. Oh, God, Liz said, but not in a panicky way, more like she'd been expecting it. Here we go. She had her badge clipped to her belt and unzipped her parka so it would show. Then she went out front and came back with two cops. They were also wearing parkas with Westchester County police patches on them. Cheese it, the cops, Mr. Thomas said, which I didn't understand at all. Later, when I asked Mom, she told me it was slang from the olden days of the 1950s. This is Miss Conklin, Liz said. She's my friend and was Mr. Thomas's agent. She asked me to run her up here because she was concerned someone might take the opportunity to steal souvenirs. Or manuscripts, my mother added. The little tape recorder was safe in her bag and her phone was in the back pocket of her jeans. One in particular, the last book in a cycle of novels Mr. Thomas was writing. Liz gave her a look that said, enough already, but my mother continued. He just finished it, and millions of people will want to read it. I felt it my duty to make sure they get the chance. The cops didn't seem all that interested. They were here to look at the room where Mr. Thomas had died. Also, to make sure the people who had been observed on the grounds had a good reason to be there. 
I believe he died in his study, Mom said and pointed toward La Petite Maison. Uh Uh-huh, one of the cops said. That's what we heard. We'll check it out. He had to bend down with his hands on his knees to get FaceTime with me. I was pretty shrimpy in those days. What's your name, son? James Conklin? I gave Mr. Thomas a pointed look. Jamie? This is my mother. I took her hand. Are you playing hooky today, Jamie? Before I could answer, Mom cut in smooth as silk. I usually pick him up when he gets out of school, but I thought I might not get back in time today, so we swung by to get him, didn't we, Liz? Roger that, Liz said. Officers, we didn't check the study, so I can't tell you if it's locked or not. Housekeeper left it open with the body inside, the one who'd talked to me, he said. But she gave me her keys, and we'll lock up after we have a quick look around. You might tell them there was no foul play, Mr. Thomas said. I had a heart attack. Hurt like the devil. I was going to tell them no such thing. I was only nine, but that didn't make me stupid. Is there also a key to the gate? Liz asked. She was being all pro now. Because it was open when we arrived. There is, and we'll lock it when we leave, the second cop said. Good move parking your car there, detective. Liz spread her hands as if to say it was all in a day's work. If you're set, we'll get out of your way. The cop who had spoken to me said, we should know what that valuable manuscript looks like so we can make sure it's safe. This was a ball my mother could carry. He sent the original to me just last week on a thumb drive. I don't think there's another copy. He was pretty paranoid. I was, Mr. Thomas admitted. His shorts were sinking again. Glad you were here to keep an eye out, the second cop said. He and the other one shook hands with Mom and Liz, also with me. Then they started down the gravel path to the little green building where Mr. Thomas had died. Later on, I found out a whole lot of writers died at their desks. Must be a type A occupation. Let's go, champ, Liz said. She tried to take my hand, but I wouldn't let her. Go stand over by the swimming pool for a minute, I said. Both of you. Why? Mom asked. I looked at my mother in a way I don't think I ever had before, as if she was stupid. And right then, I thought she was being stupid. Both of them were, not to mention rude as fuck. Because you got what you wanted, and I need to say thank you. Oh my God, Mom said and slapped her brow again. What was I thinking? Thank you, Regis. So much. Mom was directing her thank you to a flower bed, so I took her arm and turned her. He's over here, Mom. She said another thank you, to which Mr. Thomas didn't respond. He didn't seem to care. Then she walked over to where Liz was standing by the empty pool, lighting another cigarette. I didn't really need to say thank you. By then, I knew that dead people don't give much of a shit about things like that. But I said thanks anyway. It was only polite, and besides, I wanted something else. My mom's friend, I said. Liz? Mr. Thomas didn't reply, but he looked at her. She still mostly thinks I'm making it up about seeing you. I mean, she knows something weird happened because no kid could make up that whole story. By the way, I loved what happened to George Threadgill. Thank you. He deserved no better. But she'll work it around in her head so in the end she's got it the way she wants it. She will rationalize. If that's what you call it. It is. Well, is there... Any way you can show her you're here? I was thinking about how Mr. Burkett scratched his cheek when his wife kissed him. I don't know. Jimmy, do you have any idea what comes next for me? I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas, I don't. I suppose I will find out for myself. He walked toward the pool where he'd never swim again. Someone might fill it when warm weather returned, but by then he would be long gone. Mom and Liz were talking quietly and sharing Liz's cigarette. One of the things I didn't like about Liz was how she'd gotten my mother smoking again. Only a little, and only with her, but still. Mr. Thomas stood in front of Liz, drew in a deep breath, and blew it out. Liz didn't have bangs to blow on. Her hair was pulled back tight and tied in a ponytail. But she still slitted her eyes the way you will when the wind gusts in your face, and recoiled. She would have fallen into the pool, I think, if Mom hadn't grabbed her. I said, did you feel that? Stupid question. Of course she had. 
that was Mr. Thomas, who was now walking away from us, back toward his study. Thanks again, Mr. Thomas, I called. He didn't turn but raised a hand to me before putting it back in the pocket of his shorts. I was getting an excellent view of his plumber's crack, that's what mom called it when she spotted a guy wearing low-riding jeans, and if that's also too much information for you, too bad. We made him tell us in one hour everything it had taken him months of thinking to come up with. He couldn't say no, and maybe that gave him the right to show us his ass. Of course, I was the only one who could see it. 14. It's time to talk about Liz Dutton, so check it out. Check her out. She was about 5'6", my mom's height, with shoulder-length black hair, when it wasn't yanked back in her cop-approved ponytail, that was. And she had what some of the boys in my fourth grade class would call, as if they had any idea what they were talking about, a smokin' hot bod. She had a great smile and gray eyes that were usually warm. Unless she was mad, that is. When she was mad, those gray eyes could turn as cold as a sleety day in November. I liked her because she could be kind, like when my mouth and throat were so dry and she gave me what was left in that Burger King Coke without me having to ask her. My mother was just fixated on getting the ins and outs of Mr. Thomas's unwritten last book. Also, she would sometimes bring me a matchbox car to add to my growing collection, and once in a while would get right down on the floor beside me and we'd play together. Sometimes she'd give me a hug and ruffle my hair. Sometimes she'd tickle me until I screamed for her to stop or I'd pee myself, which she called watering my jockeys. I didn't like her because sometimes, especially after our trip to Cobblestone Cottage, I'd look up and catch her studying me like I was a bug on a slide. There was no warmth in her gray eyes then. Or she'd tell me my room was a mess, which, in fairness, it usually was, although my mom didn't seem to mind. It hurts my eyes, Liz would say. Or, are you going to live that way all your life, Jamie? She also thought I was too old for a nightlight, but my mother put an end to that discussion, just saying, Leave him alone, Liz. He'll give it up when he's ready. The biggest thing? She stole a lot of my mother's attention and affection that I used to get. Much later, when I read some of Freud's theories in a sophomore psych class, it occurred to me that, as a kid, I'd had a classic mother fixation seeing Liz as a rival. Well, duh. Of course I was jealous, and I had good reason to be. I had no father, didn't even know who the fuck he was because my mother wouldn't talk about him. Later, I found out she had good reason for that, but at the time, all I knew was that it was you and me against the world, Jamie. Until Liz came along, that was. And remember this, I didn't have a whole lot of mom even before Liz, because mom was too busy trying to save the agency after she and Uncle Harry got fucked by James McKenzie. I hated that he and I had the same first name. Mom was always mining for gold in the slush pile, hoping to come across another Jane Reynolds. I would have to say that liking and disliking were pretty evenly balanced on the day we went to Cobblestone Cottage, with liking slightly ahead for at least four reasons. Matchbox cars and trucks were not to be sneezed at. Sitting between them on the sofa and watching the Big Bang Theory was fun and cozy. I wanted to like who my mother liked. Liz made her happy. Later, there it is again, not so much. That Christmas was excellent. I got cool presents from both of them, and we had an early lunch at Chinese Tuxedo before Liz had to go to work because, she said, crime never takes a holiday. So Mom and me went to the old place on Park Avenue. Mom stayed in touch with Mr. Burkett after we moved, and sometimes the three of us hung out. Because he's lonely, Mom said. But also, because why, Jamie? Because we like him, I said, and that was true. We had Christmas dinner in his apartment. Actually, turkey sandwiches with cranberry sauce from Zabar's because his daughter was on the West Coast and couldn't come back. I found out more about that later. And yes, because we liked him. As I may have told you, Mr. Burkett was actually Professor Burkett, now Emeritus, which I understood to mean that he was retired but still allowed to hang around NYU and teach the occasional class in his super smart specialty, which happened to be E&E. 
English and European literature. I once made the mistake of calling it lit, and he corrected me, saying lit was either for lights or being drunk. Anyway, even with no stuffing and only carrots for veg, it was a nice little meal, and we had more presents after. I gave Mr. Burkett a snow globe for his collection. I later found out it had been his wife's collection, but he admired it, thanked me, and put it on the mantle with the others. Mom gave him a big book called The New Annotated Sherlock Holmes, because back when he was working full-time, he'd taught a course called Mystery and Gothic in English Fiction. He gave Mom a locket that he said had belonged to his wife. Mom protested and said he should save it for his daughter. Mr. Burkett said that Siobhan had gotten all the good pieces of Mona's jewelry, and besides, if you snooze, you lose. Meaning, I guess, that if his daughter, from the sound of it I thought her name was S-H-I-V-O-N-N, couldn't bother to come east, she could go whistle. I sort of agreed with that, because who knew how many more Christmases she might have her father around. He was older than God. Besides, I had a soft spot for fathers, not having one myself. I know they say you can't miss what you've never had, and there's some truth to that, but I knew I was missing something. My present for Mr. Burkett was also a book. It was called Twenty Unexpurgated Fairy Tales. Do you know what unexpurgated means, Jamie? Once a professor, always a professor, I guess. I shook my head. What do you reckon? He was leaning forward with his big, gnarly hands between his skinny thighs smiling. Can you guess from the context of the title? Uncensored? Like R-rated? Nailed it, he said. Well done. I hope there's not a lot of sex in them, Mom said. He reads at a high school level, but he's only nine. No sex, just good old violence, Mr. Burkett said. I never called him professor in those days because it seemed stuck up somehow. For instance, in the original tale of Cinderella, which you'll find here, the Wicked Stepsisters, Mom turned to me and stage whispered, Spoiler alert. Mr. Burkett was not to be deterred. He was in full teaching mode. I didn't mind. It was interesting. In the original, the Wicked Stepsisters cut off their toes in their efforts to make the glass slipper fit. Ew. I said this in a way that meant, Gross, tell me more. And the glass slipper wasn't glass at all, Jamie. That seems to have been a translation error, which has been immortalized by Walt Disney, that homogenizer of fairy tales. The slipper was actually made of squirrel fur. Wow, I said. Not as interesting as the stepsisters cutting off their toes, but I wanted them to keep rolling. In the original story of the Frog King, the princess doesn't kiss the frog. Instead, she... No more, Mom said. Let him read the stories and find out for himself. Always best. Mr. Burkett agreed. And perhaps we'll discuss them, Jamie. You mean you'll discuss them while I listen, I thought, but that would be okay. Should we have hot chocolate? Mom asked. It's also from Zabar's, and they make the best. I can reheat it in a jiff. Lay on, Macduff, Mr. Burkett said. And damned be him that first cries hold enough. Which meant yes, and we had it with whipped cream. In my memory, that's the best Christmas I had as a kid, from the Santa pancakes Liz made in the morning to the hot chocolate in Mr. Burkett's apartment, just down the hall from where Mom and I used to live. New Year's Eve was also fine, although I fell asleep on the couch between Mom and Liz before the ball dropped. All good. But in 2010, the argument started. Before that, Liz and my mother used to have what Mom called spirited discussions, mostly about books. They liked many of the same writers, they bonded over Regis Thomas, remember, and the same movies, but Liz thought my mother was too focused on things like sales and advances and various writers' track records instead of the stories, and she actually laughed at the works of a couple of mom's clients, calling them subliterate, to which my mother responded that those subliterate writers paid the rent and kept the lights on, kept them lit not to mention paying for the care home where Uncle Harry was marinating in his own pee. Then the arguments began to move away from the more or less safe ground of books and films and get more heated. Some were about politics. Liz loved this Congress guy, John Boehner. 
My mother called him John Boner, which is what some kids of my acquaintance called a stiffy. Or maybe she meant to pull a boner, but I don't really think so. Mom thought Nancy Pelosi, another politician which you probably know as she's still around, was a brave woman working in a boys' club. Liz thought she was your basic liberal dingleberry. The biggest fight they ever had about politics was when Liz said she didn't completely believe Obama had been born in America. Mom called her stupid and racist. They were in the bedroom with the door shut. That was where most of their arguments happened. But their voices were raised and I could hear every word from the living room. A few minutes later, Liz left, slamming the door on her way out and didn't come back for almost a week. When she did, they made up in the bedroom with the door closed. I heard that too because the making up part was pretty noisy, groans and laughter and squeaky bed springs. They argued about police tactics too, and this was still a few years before Black Lives Matter. That was a sore point with Liz, as you might guess. Mom decried what she called racial profiling, and Liz said, you can only draw a profile if the features are clear. Didn't get that then, don't get it now. Mom said when black people and white people were sentenced for the same type of crime, it was the black people who got hit with the heaviest sentences, and sometimes the white people didn't do time at all. Liz countered by saying, you show me a Martin Luther King Boulevard in any city, and I'll show you a high crime area. The arguments started to come closer together, and even at my tender age, I knew one big reason why. They were drinking too much. Hot breakfasts, which my mother used to make twice or even three times a week, pretty much ceased. I'd come out in the morning, and they'd be sitting there in their matching bathrobes, hunched over mugs of coffee, their faces pale and their eyes red. There'd be three, sometimes four, empty bottles of wine in the trash with cigarette butts in them. My mother would say, Get some juice and cereal for yourself while I get dressed, Jamie. And Liz would tell me not to make a lot of noise because the aspirin hadn't kicked in yet, her head was splitting, and she either had roll call or was on stakeout for some case or other. Not the thumper task force, though. She didn't get on that. I'd drink my juice and eat my cereal quiet as a mouse on those mornings. By the time Mom was dressed and ready to walk me to school, ignoring Liz's comment that I was now big enough to make that walk by myself, she was starting to come around. All of this seemed normal to me. I don't think the world starts to come into focus until you're 15 or 16. Up until then, you just take what you've got and roll with it. Those two hungover women hunched over their coffee was just how I started my day on some mornings that eventually became lots of mornings. I didn't even notice the smell of wine that began to permeate everything. Only part of me must have noticed because Years later, in college, when my roomie spilled a bottle of Zinfandel in the living room of our little apartment, it all came back, and it was like getting hit in the face with a plank. Liz's snarly hair, my mother's hollow eyes, how I knew to close the cupboard where we kept the cereal, slowly and quietly. I told my roomie I was going down to the 7-Eleven to get a pack of cigarettes. Yes, I eventually picked up that particular bad habit but basically I just had to get away from that smell. Given a choice between seeing dead folks, yes, I still see them, and the memories brought on by the smell of spilled wine, I'd pick the dead folks. Any day of the fucking week. 15. My mother spent four months writing The Secret of Roanoke with her trusty tape recorder always by her side. I asked her once if writing Mr. Thomas's book was like painting a picture. She thought about it and said it was more like one of those paint-by-numbers kits where you just followed the directions and ended up with something that was supposedly suitable for framing. She hired an assistant so she could work on it pretty much full-time. She told me on one of our walks home from school, which was just about the only fresh air that she ever got during the winter of 2009 and 2010, that she couldn't afford to hire an assistant and couldn't afford not to. Barbara Means was fresh out of the English program at Vassar and was willing to toil in the agency at bargain basement wages for the experience, and she was actually pretty good, which was a big help. I liked her big green eyes, which I thought were beautiful. Mom wrote, Mom rewrote, Mom read the Roanoke books, 
and little else during those months, wanting to immerse herself in Regis Thomas's style. She listened to my voice. She rewound and fast-forwarded. She filled in the picture. One night, deep into their second bottle of wine, I heard her tell Liz that if she had to write another sentence containing a phrase such as, firm thrusting breasts tipped with rosy nipples, she might lose her mind. She also had to field calls from the trades, and once from page six of the New York Post, about the state of the final Thomas book because all sorts of rumors were flying around. All this came back to me and vividly when Sue Grafton died without writing the final book of her alphabet series of mysteries. Mom said she hated the lying. Ah, but you're so good at it, I remember Liz saying, which earned her one of the cold looks I saw from my mother more and more in the final year of their relationship. She lied to Regis's editor as well, telling her Regis had instructed her not long before he died that the manuscript of Secret should be withheld from everyone, except Mom, of course, until 2010, in order to build reader interest. Liz said she thought that was a little bit shaky, but Mom said it would fly. Fiona never edited him anyway, she said. Meaning Fiona Yarbrough, who worked for Doubleday, Mr. Thomas's publisher. Her only job was writing Regis a letter after she got each new manuscript, telling him that he'd outdone himself this time. Once the book was finally turned in, Mom spent a week pacing and snapping at everyone, I was not excluded from said snappery, waiting for Fiona to call and say, Regis didn't write this book, it doesn't sound a bit like him, I think you wrote it, Tia. But in the end, it was fine. Either Fiona never guessed or didn't care. Certainly the reviewers never guessed when the book was crashed into production and appeared in the fall of 2010. Publishers Weekly. Thomas saved the best for last. Kirkus Reviews. Fans of sweet, savage historical fiction will once more be in bodice-ripping clover. Dwight Garner in the New York Times. The trudging, flavorless prose is typical Thomas, the rough equivalent of a heaping plate of food from an all-you-can-eat buffet in a dubious roadside restaurant. Mom didn't care about the reviews, she cared about the huge advance and the refreshed royalties from the previous Roanoke volumes. She bitched mightily about only getting 15% when she had written the whole thing, but got a small measure of revenge by dedicating it to herself. Because I deserve it, she said. I'm not so sure, Liz said. When you think about it, T, you are just the secretary. Maybe you should have dedicated it to Jamie. This earned Liz another of my mom's cold looks, but I thought Liz had something there. Although when you really thought about it, I was also just the secretary. It was still Mr. Thomas's book, dead or not. 16. Now check this out. I told you at least some of the reasons why I liked Liz, and there were probably a few more. I told you all of the reasons I didn't like Liz, and there were probably a few more of those too. What I never considered until later, yep, there's that word again, was the possibility that she didn't like me. Why would I? I was used to being loved, almost blasé about it. I was loved by my mother and my teachers, especially Mrs. Wilcox, my third grade teacher, who hugged me and said she'd miss me on the day school let out. I was loved by my best friends, Frankie Ryder and Scott Abramowitz, although, of course, we didn't talk or even think about it that way. And don't forget Lily Reinhardt, who once put a big smackaroo on my mouth. She also gave me a Hallmark card before I changed schools. It had a sad-looking puppy on the front, and inside it said, I'll miss you every day you're away. She signed it with a little heart over the I in her name, also X's and O's. Liz at least liked me, at least for a while, I'm sure of it. But that began to change after Cobblestone Cottage. That was when she started to see me as a freak of nature. I think, no, I know, that was when Liz started to be scared of me. And it's hard to like what you're scared of. Maybe impossible. Although she thought nine was old enough for me to walk home from school by myself, Liz sometimes came for me instead of mom if Liz was working what she called the swing shift, which started at four in the morning and ended at noon. It was a shift detectives tried to avoid, but Liz got it quite a bit. That was another thing I never wondered about then, but later, there it is again, yeah, 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 right, right, right. I realized that she wasn't exactly liked by her bosses or trusted. 
It didn't have anything to do with the relationship she had with my mother. When it came to sex, the NYPD was slowly moving into the 21st century. It wasn't the drinking, either, because she wasn't the only cop who liked to put it away. But certain people she worked with had begun to suspect that Liz was a dirty cop. And, spoiler alert, they were right. 17. I need to tell you about two particular times Liz got me after school. On both occasions, she was in her car. Not the one we took out to Copplestone Cottage, but the one she called her personal. The first time was in 2011, while she and Mom were still a thing. The second was in 2013, a year or so after they stopped being a thing. I'll get to that, but first things first. I came out of school that day in March with my backpack slung over just one shoulder, which was how the cool sixth grade boys did it, and Liz was waiting for me at the curb in her Honda Civic. On the yellow part of the curb, as a matter of fact, which was for handicapped people, but she had her little police officer on call sign for that, which you could argue should have told me something about her character, even at the tender age of 11. I got in, trying not to wrinkle my nose at the smell of stale cigarette smoke that not even the little pine tree air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror could hide. By then, thanks to the secret of Roanoke, we had our own apartment and didn't have to live in the agency anymore, so I was expecting a ride home, but Liz turned toward downtown instead. Where are we going? I asked. Little field trip, champ, she said. You'll see. The field trip was to Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, final resting place of Duke Ellington, Herman Melville, and Bartholomew Bat Masterson, among others. I know about them because I looked it up and later wrote a report about Woodlawn for school. Liz drove in from Webster Avenue and then just started cruising up and down the lanes. It was nice, but it was also a little scary. Do you know how many people planted here? She asked. And when I shook my head. 300,000. Less than the population of Tampa, but not by much. I checked it out on Wikipedia. Why are we here? Because it's interesting, but I've got homework. This wasn't a lie, but I only had like a half hour's worth. It was a bright, sunshiny day, and she seemed normal enough. Just Liz, my mom's friend. But still, this was sort of a freaky field trip. She totally ignored the homework gambit. People are being buried here all the time. Look to your left. She pointed and slowed from 25 or so to a bare creep. Where she was pointing, people were standing around a coffin placed over an open grave. Some kind of minister was standing at the head of the grave with an open book in his hand. I knew he wasn't a rabbi because he wasn't wearing a beanie. Liz stopped the car. Nobody at the service paid any attention. They were absorbed in whatever the minister was saying. You see dead people, she said. I accept that now. Hard not to after what happened at Thomas's place. Do you see any here? No, I said, more uneasy than ever. Not because of Liz, but because I'd just gotten the news that we were currently surrounded by 300,000 dead bodies. Even though I knew the dead went away after a few days, a week at most, I almost expected to see them standing beside their graves, or right on top of them, then maybe converging on us like in a fucking zombie movie. Are you sure? I looked at the funeral, or graveside service, or whatever you call it. The minister must have started a prayer because all the mourners had bowed their heads. All except one, that was. He was just standing there and looking unconcernedly up at the sky. That guy in the blue suit, I said finally. The one who's not wearing a tie. He might be dead, but I can't be sure if there's nothing wrong with them when they die, nothing that shows they look pretty much like anyone else. I don't see a man without a tie, she said. Well, okay then, he's dead. Do they always come to their burials? Liz asked. How should I know? This is my first graveyard, Liz. I saw Mrs. Burkett at her funeral, but I don't know about the graveyard, because me and Mom didn't go to that part, we just went home. But you see him. She was staring at the funeral party, like she was in a trance. You could go over there and talk to him, the way you talked to Regis Thomas that day. I'm not going over there! I don't like to say I squawked this, but I pretty much did. In front of all his friends, in front of his wife and kids, you can't make me. Mellow out, champ, she said, 
and ruffled my hair. Just trying to get it straight in my mind. How did he get here, do you think? Because he shouldn't take an Uber. I don't know. I want to go home. Pretty soon, she said. And we continued our cruise of the cemetery, passing tombs and monuments and about a billion regular gravestones. We passed three more graveside ceremonies in progress, two small, like the first one where the star of the show was attending sight unseen, and one humongous one where about 200 people were gathered on a hillside. And the guy in charge, Beanie, check, plus a cool-looking shawl, was using a microphone. Each time Liz asked me if I could see the dead person, and each time I told her I didn't have a clue. You probably wouldn't tell me if you did, she said. I can tell you're in a pissy mood. I'm not in a pissy mood. You are, though, and if you tell T I brought you out here, we'll probably have a fight. I don't suppose you could tell her we went for ice cream, could you? We were almost back to Webster Avenue by then, and I was feeling a little better, telling myself Liz had a right to be curious that anyone would be. Maybe if you actually bought me one. Bribery, <laughs> that's a class B felony. She laughed, gave my hair a ruffle, and we were pretty much all right again. We left the cemetery, and I saw a young woman in a black dress sitting on a bench and waiting for her bus. A little girl in a white dress and shiny black shoes was sitting beside her. The girl had golden hair and rosy cheeks and a hole in her throat. I waved to her. Liz didn't see me do it. She was waiting for a break in traffic so she could make her turn. I didn't tell her what I saw. That night Liz left after dinner to either go to work or go back to her own place, and I almost told my mother. In the end, I didn't. In the end, I kept the little girl with the golden hair to myself. Later, I would think that the hole in her throat was from the little girl choking on food, and that they cut into her throat so she could breathe, but it was too late. She was sitting there beside her mother, and her mother didn't know. But I knew. I saw. When I waved to her, she waved back. 18. While we were eating our ice cream at Lickety Split, Liz phoned my mother to tell her where we were and what we were up to. Liz said, It must be so strange, what you can do. So weird. Doesn't it freak you out? I thought of asking her if it freaked her out to look up at night and see the stars and know they go on forever and ever, but didn't bother. I just said, no. You get used to marvelous things, you take them for granted. You can try not to, but you do. There's too much wonder, that's all. It's everywhere. 19. I'll tell you about the other time Liz picked me up from school very soon, but first I have to tell you about the day they broke up. That was a scary morning, believe me. I woke up that day even before my alarm clock went off because Mom was yelling. I'd heard her mad before, but never that mad. You brought it into the apartment where I live with my son. Liz answered something, but it was a little more than a mumble, and I couldn't hear. Do you think that matters to me? Mom shouted. On the cop shows, that's what they call serious weight. I could go to jail as an accessory. Don't be dramatic, Liz said, louder now. There was never any chance of- That doesn't matter, Mom yelled. It was here. It still is here on the fucking table beside the fucking sugar bowl. You brought drugs into my house. Serious weight. Would you stop saying that? This isn't an episode of Law and Order. Now Liz was also getting loud, getting mad. I stood with one ear pressed against my bedroom door, barefoot and dressed in my pajamas, my heart starting to pound. This wasn't a discussion or even an argument. This was more. Worse. If you hadn't been going through my pockets, searching your stuff, is that what you think? I was trying to do you a favor. I was going to take your extra uniform coat to the cleaners along with my wool skirt. How long has it been there? Only a little while. The guy it belongs to is out of town. He's going to be back tomorrow. How long? 
Liz's reply was again too low for me to hear. Then why bring it here? I don't understand that. Why not put it in the gun safe at your place? I don't, she stopped. Don't what? Don't actually have a gun safe, and there have been break-ins in my building. Besides, I was going to be here. We were going to spend the week together. I thought it would save me a trip. Save you a trip. To this, Liz made no reply. No gun safe in your apartment. How many other things have you been lying to me about? Mom didn't sound mad anymore, at least not right then. She sounded hurt, like she wanted to cry. I felt like going out and telling Liz to leave my mother alone, even if my mother had started it by finding whatever she'd found, the serious weight. But I just stood there, listening, trembling too. Liz mumbled some more. Is this why you're in trouble at the department? Are you using as well as, I don't know, couriering the stuff, distributing the stuff? I'm not using and I'm not distributing. Well, you're passing it on. Mom's voice was rising again. That sounds like distributing to me. Then she went back to what was really troubling her. Well, not the only thing, but the one that was troubling her the most. You brought it into my apartment where my son is. You lock your gun in your car. I always insisted on that. But now I find two pounds of cocaine in your spare jacket. She actually laughed, but not the way people do when something is funny. Your, your spare police jacket. It's not two pounds, sounding sulky. I grew up weighing meat in my father's market, Mom said. I know two pounds when I've got it in my hand. I'll get it out, she said, right now. You do that, Liz, post haste. And you can come back to get your things by appointment when I'm here and Jamie's not. Otherwise, never. You don't mean that, Liz said but even through the door, I could tell she didn't believe what she was saying. I absolutely do. I'm going to do you a favor and not report what I found to your watch captain, but if you ever show your face here again, except for that one time to pick up your shit, I will. That's a promise. You're throwing me out. Really? Really? Take your dope and fuck off. Liz started to cry. That was horrible. Then after she was gone, Mom started to cry, and that was even worse. I went out into the kitchen and hugged her. How much of that did you hear? Mom asked, and before I could answer, all of it, I imagine. I'm not going to lie to you, Jamie, or gloss it over. She had dope, a lot of dope, and I never want you to say a word about it, okay? Was it really cocaine? I had also been crying, but didn't realize it until I heard my voice come out all husky. It was, and since you already know so much, I might as well tell you, I tried it in college just a couple of times. I tasted what was in the baggie I found, and my tongue went numb. It was coke, all right? But it's gone. She took it. Moms know what kids are scared of if they're good moms. A critic might call that a romantic notion, but I think it's just a practical fact. She did, and we're fine. It was a nasty way to start the day, but it's over. We'll draw a line under it and move on. Okay, but is Liz really not your friend anymore? Mom used a dish towel to wipe her face. I don't think she's been my friend for quite a while now. I just didn't know it. Now, get ready for school. That night, while I was doing my homework, I heard a glug, glug, glug coming from the kitchen and smelled wine. The smell was a lot stronger than usual, even on nights when Mom and Liz put away a lot of vino. I came out of my room to see if she'd spilled a bottle, although there had been no crash of glass, and saw Mom standing over the sink with a jug of red wine in one hand and a jug of white in the other. She was pouring it down the drain. Why are you throwing it away? Did it go bad? In a manner of speaking, she said. I think it started to go bad about eight months ago. It's time to stop. I found out later that my mother went to AA for a while after she broke up with Liz, then decided she didn't need it. Old men pissing and moaning about a drink they took 30 years ago, she said. 
and I don't think she quit completely because once or twice I thought I smelled wine on her breath when she kissed me goodnight. Maybe from dinner with a client. If she kept a bottle in the apartment, I never knew where she stashed it, not that I looked very hard. What I do know is that in the years that followed, I never saw her drunk and I never saw her hungover. That was good enough for me.